All right, I'm going to make a seamless transition here into our next section or segment. And uh, I want to give a warm welcome to um, all of our, our students uh, joining us from around the world. Uh, this session here from, oh, about 10 o'clock until 11 o'clock uh, mountain time. Um, for the next, you know, 50 minutes or so, we have students from four different universities who are joining us here. And uh, some just uh, will be offering individual presentations and others will be kind of sharing in a team of maybe two people kind of talking about various aspects of their, their own universities or institutions programs that are tied to this protected areas and tourism space. Um, and then also each presentation will be kind of giving these students a chance to share some of their own research with the rest of us and projects that they are, they're personally passionate about and have been involved in. Uh, so I am just super, super excited to, to welcome all of you here. Uh, we do have an order for this, this session. So uh, we're gonna go through as it kind of, uh, as everyone knows in the, the conference program, uh, our, our four universities here, we're gonna start with two students from the University of North Texas. Then we'll continue with one student from Colorado State University, uh, one student from Central China Normal University. And then finally, we'll wrap up with two students presenting from the University of Pisa in Italy. So um, I think uh, to kick things off here, um, let's just start with our friends from University of North Texas who are involved in uh, the Master of Science program in International Sustainable Tourism or the MIST program. So um, Megan Kelly and Bobby Robbins are, are joining us here. I'm gonna briefly read their bios so everybody kind of gets a little background on, on who's presenting. Um, Megan Kelly graduated from the University of North Texas with a master's in international sustainable tourism. Her research focused on analyzing uh, sustainable tourist behaviors on Instagram uh, for the official tag of hashtag visit Costa Rica. She was awarded a Fulbright to Chile where she will continue researching tourist behavior on social media with a focus on small business impacts and training. Uh, currently she works as a marketing and regenerative tourism specialist for First Nature Tours in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and then Bobby Robbins joined us uh, from the University of North Texas crew here, is a second year international sustainable tourism graduate student um, in this joint program between the University of North Texas uh, and uh, CATI, I'm not sure what that stands for actually, C-A-T-I-E in Costa Rica. Uh, from 2012 to 2019, Bobby lived at the foothills of the Himalayas along the ancient T horse trail in Yunnan, China, Southern China, beautiful area. There he co-founded a social enterprise called Harmony Bridge that focuses on economic development in remote ethnic minority villages through sustainable tourism development. Prior to relocating to China, Bobby worked as a corporate consultant specializing in strategy and leadership development. Uh, Bobby also served for 15 years as a U.S. Army officer. So uh, Megan and Bobby, it's an honor to have you with us. I really wish we could sit down. I'd love to talk with you both more about the exciting things you're doing. My thought is that, you know, the session in general, we've kind of told you, okay, eight minute presentations. Um, and then I think we will have time here to uh, field at least one question on the back end. Um, so I'll hand it over to you. A uh, warm welcome to you both. Yeah, thank you so much. So yeah, I'm Bobby and I'm, uh, I'm joined by Megan and our esteemed professor, Dr. Varendra Casey. And we are with the University of North Texas in a joint program with Katia, which is uh, Spanish uh, for the Center for Agricultural Tropical Instruction and Research. And uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, next slide. So the MIST program, the Masters of Science in International Sustainable Tourism, year one, we're based out of Denton, Texas. And we're based in a cohort program where, so the, the courses that you see listed below, these are not 
electives. You don't really have a choice on what you're going to take because you're working together with a group like you see over here in the in the pictures, a group of students from various backgrounds working together throughout uh, the program. But in year one, we're looking at stats in our quantitative research class. We're looking at environmental impact assessment, looking at a lot of the, the elements of hospitality and tourism, and then getting our foundation from a theoretical perspective into sustainable tourism. And then in year two, we move on to, uh, to Katia. At Cartier, the second year really dives deep into the theories of sustainability, but this is partnered with visiting the actual destinations in Costa Rica, known as a green tourist destination. While the students are there, we assess how their tourism development and how it's progressing to develop and the implications that has on the community, the environment and economy. During these trips, we apply these, this theoretical knowledge and the research themes that we're choosing as if we were actually consulting consultants in this program. This includes interviewing stakeholders and actually doing projects with tourism operators, culminating in a final research project that ties everything in this program together. So the intention of this research, this is a project that I worked on with Dr. Casey. The intention is to evaluate communication networks of buffer zone residents at Bardia National Park. Protected areas, as we know, play a vital role in biodiversity conservation, but human wildlife conflict at protected areas threatens long-term biodiversity goals. Communication patterns can ease or exacerbate the impact of conflicts. The research methodology included a survey questionnaire to eight of the 19 buffer zone communities and data collection was adapted from head of household communication to household adult age 18 and up. A stratified sampling technique was used to allow for equal representation of the selected communities, approximately 5% from each community. In the end, we had 87 usable surveys. Our key findings concluded that there was a high density of network ties with parents and neighbors, and they were viewed by the respondents as the most supportive on our scales. Those groups we might consider to be the most useful as academics in aiding human wildlife conflicts, such as the Department of National Parks and Wildlife Conservation, were viewed by respondents as the least used and least useful. User committees, on the other hand, though on the scale identified as least used, they were also viewed as the most supportive. These social networks are very clear by the respondents on where we should be guiding our knowledge and where we should be moving forward. Gender and socioeconomic status do impact how people view these networks. For example, if you're female, lower economic status, or even lower education, including geographic boundaries. If you're farther away from an office, all of these influence communication networks and how the community feels support. So a male will feel a different kind of support. Someone with higher education will feel a different kind of support. And this is so valuable when protecting these border communities and our biodiversity goals. Social network analysis and resource management can help those understand the feelings of support and also provide practical implications on how to further achieve conservation goals by addressing these human wildlife conflicts. Communication is one of the most effective tools we have and it already exists if we understand how to use it. So in uh, spring of this year with uh, Dr. Casey and one of my other cohort members, we took a look at agritourism in the midst of the pandemic. And agritourism is a component of nature tourism and it's a huge deal in Texas. And what we mean by agritourism is we're looking at working farms and ranches, bona fide agricultural operations that are incorporating tourism and hospitality into their operations. As we see, this, uh, this sector of the agriculture tends to be smaller operations, uh, women-run operations uh, tend to be older. They're looking for means for, for uh, diversifying their income streams. And so it's becoming a growing segment of the hospitality and tourism industry. So the purpose of our research is we just really wanted to understand what's going on with this segment what, what are the challenges that they're experiencing? How is policy 
in the state of Texas impacting these businesses and looking about what they have as uh, opportunities for the future. We did this specifically in the context of COVID-19 because, because of the increase in nature-based tourism during COVID-19, we felt that this was critical to understand how a sector like this is going to move forward. The method that we used, we took a list from Texas A&M's Agricultural Life Science Extension Office, and it was a list of about 400 or so agritourism businesses in the state. And we tried to divide it as, as uh, evenly as we could across the state, but ultimately it came down to people whether or not they had time to participate. We were able to get 24 of those businesses to participate in a uh, semi-structured interview where we would then transcribe uh, verbatim the interview. And then we used uh, Braun and Clark's thematic analysis process. You can see a picture of how we analyze that data over on the right to cluster the different uh, nuggets of information that we were able to glean from each of the participants and uh, bring them into major themes and sub-themes. So our key findings, uh, you can see our major themes and sub-themes over on the right. Um, Non-financial motivation was a significant uh, motivator for the people participating in our survey, whether it was because of um, actually not being motivated by making money or whether they had justified it in their minds to keep going about what they were passionate about. Across the board, we found people wanting to influence and care for their community, to teach people. And so motivation was uh, a very interesting finding. A big piece of this was the ability of this group of entrepreneurs to adapt to a really challenging time during COVID-19. And so whether they were forced to, to adapt by local authorities or whether they did it on their own, we saw across the board that they were adapting, making changes so that they could keep going forward. Uh, none of the people that we, that we talked to had obviously sh uh, shuttered their operations. They kept going and they did that through adaptation. Part of those adaptations, they were able to hold on to those. They were holding on to those adaptations, things that they might not have changed otherwise, but given the lessons learned that they had during the pandemic, they were able to modify their operations. But still, the same types of challenges, broader than COVID, uh, remain within this sector. And a lot of it has to do with their ability to get labor. And generationally, we see this move away from farms family operations that find that the kids have gone off to be engineers and doctors and lawyers and such, and they aren't interested on in being back in the farm. The lack of policy impact was also significant. Uh, despite this being a, a great potential to help farmers and bolster economic development in these rural areas, uh, we found that there was very little policy impact from the state of Texas, which which leads to some of our implications. There is an opportunity here to improve extension services and promotion. These are within the power of the state of Texas, uh, but we found that the extension agents shied away from anything related to tourism or hospitality. They were really crop focused. And so our participants found it very difficult to get any training uh, on the tourism side of things. Furthermore, promotion in the state of Texas, when you think of the destination management operation within the state, uh, they're not promoting actively the agritourism sector. As you look towards future research, um, mental health is, is a big piece. There was a lot of overlap that we saw with nature-based tourism being the mental health outlet for people during COVID-19. And so there's additional opportunity for research as it relates to alignment with the values of these businesses with people's personal mental health uh, objectives. And this could be measured in terms of their purchase intent, their revisit intent. And then broadly, we need to see uh, an improvement in government policies that are going to improve this sector. Uh, the only piece of policy that we could actually find at the state level was the Agritourism Act, uh, which was a liability limiting uh, piece of legislation. And in reality, it just created more administrative burden for them without actually reducing any of their, any of their liability exposure. 
So those were our findings and uh, we look forward to any of your questions. Thank you. <laughs>
bridging hospitality, tourism, technology, and innovation, uh, which informs an interdisciplinary approach to biological and cultural or biocultural conservation through tourism. Her work is housed with Dr. Christina Cavalier's Tourism and Conservation Lab. Her research takes a standpoint approach informed by the experiences and adaptations of protected area and gateway community residents to explore biocultural dynamics through technology use, identities, and effect, which I think we'll be hearing more about in her presentation. So Julia, it's great to see you. A warm welcome and uh, take it away. Thank you so much. I will share my screen here and move through as efficiently as I can. Uh, I have put together for the 10 minute slot and so if it's eight, just let me know and I will move through as I can. Hope my screen is sharing well. Um, Thank you, Megan and Bobby, for sharing the highlights of your department and inspiring work. And thank you, Dr. Knight, for moderating this session. I've been really lucky to work with Dr. Knight, uh, Dr. Baer, Dr. Bricker, and Dr. Cavalier, all participants in this conference during my time here at Colorado State. So it is with great pride and enthusiasm that I have this opportunity to share a brief overview of my PhD experience in Dr. Cavalier's Tours and Conservation Lab within the Human Dimensions of Natural Resources Department at Colorado State. So today, I would like to briefly share um, a little bit more about my background that brought me to the Human Dimensions of Natural Resources Department, or HDNR, at CSU, specifically drawn to the work and philosophy of Dr. Cavalier's Tourism and Conservation Lab. This will lead to an overview of my research conducted within our lab, concluding my current PhD research. And finally, I will end with acknowledgments and my support of my support here at CSU and invite any questions. So again, I am delighted to be a tourism representative for my program as the HDNR department may be an uncommon department or program title for many people. It certainly was for me a few years ago. My undergraduate experience took place at Purdue University studying hospitality and tourism management with a global perspective on sustainable tourism. I took a unique turn um, in sustainable technology and interpretation with an acceptance into a dual master of science program for sustainable technology and innovation. My thesis centered upon a unique topic within waterless waste management, uh, specifically the adoption of composting toilets. In addition to, honestly, the unending humor I draw from this topic, I remain passionate about the connection of tourism to sustainable technology. For example, the adoption of waterless composting toilets within parks and protected areas. Few places fully realized or utilized the multidisciplinary areas of my background until I learned about a researcher by the name of Dr. Christina Cavalier and her tourism and conservation lab within CSU's HDNR department. It is within this area that I have my dissertation studying Western gateway community resident lived experiences during crises through concepts of identity, affect and technology use. To go a little deeper into our department, my conservation and tourism program within HDNR is guided by our department emphasis on the social aspects of ecosystems, livelihoods and tourism. The vision of our program is founded within the understanding that natural resources and conservation issues require cross-disciplinary spaces. As we've witnessed in tourism impact studies, socio-environmental issues cross political, economic, and ecological dimensions. Therefore, HDNR empowers students of diverse emphases to employ social science frameworks to engage with multiple stakeholders in areas such as, but certainly not limited to, tourism and conservation feminist political ecology, wildfire ecology, protected area management, and human wildlife interaction and conflict. Within this department, I um, would like to share more about Dr. Cavalier's lab, the work that I'm doing within here with her. I have founded my approaches to tourism and conservation within her 2019 critical tourism citizenship framework, intended to instill transformative critical thinking skills through critical pedagogy. I'd like to highlight that part of this lab is an eco-feminist approach to tourism and conservation research through the support of scholars within tourism. Within my first two semesters, I was offered multiple first authorship opportunities uh, within Dr. Cav's lab, which rapidly developed my skills in research and science communication. I've also developed as both a student and educator through my role as a graduate teaching assistant for the past two and a half years. We've conducted research in multiple areas of sustainable tourism for biocultural conservation, including the application of extended reality, uh, which mixes, which is a mix of augmented and virtual reality technology. You'll see an emphasis of areas of uh, biocultural 
and geographic overlap, such as bioregions, biomimicry, and social ecological systems in tourism planning. The inspiration for my dissertation comes from each project within the lab, particularly our two-year research project within Ketchikan, Alaska, a coastal gateway community to the Tongass National Forest. This study of resident experiences of change centering on their relationship to the coast of Ketchikan during the pandemic influenced the foundation of my ongoing dissertation focused on Nederland, Colorado, a small, beautiful mountain town as the gateway to the Rocky Mountain National and Estes Park. Oops, oh no, here we go. <laughs> so I would like to share a little bit about where my, uh, my dissertation, this brings me to um, a brief coverage. I was particularly inspired during the plenary panel discussion on industry trends yesterday, as this mentioned multiple areas of my topic. During the pandemic mobility restrictions, Western Mountain Gateway communities were overwhelmed with visitors seeking safe outdoor recreation. This uniquely impacted the Gateway communities who are often stewards of our beloved forests, lakes, and trails. Therefore, the aim of my research is to explore the relationships between changes experienced by Intermountain Western Gateway residents hosting a tourism economy during crises through concepts of identity, affect, and technology use. My objectives, listed here, may be summarized in three areas. First, to further critical and affective tour tourism research through an embodied research design of resident identities. Second, to assess how technology mediates spatial and social realities impacting identities through and during the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, I'm using the concept of cultural realignment to analyze processes and agents of change of the community during the pandemic. Cultural realignment may be understood as the intentional depiction or interpretation of culture or part of one for a specific preconceived purpose. And that comes from MacLeod in 2013. This area of research relates to identifying agents and processes of change as power dynamics. And this relates um, concepts in this area, including cultural representation, cultural interpretation, and cultural commodification. To date, I've conducted 43 in-depth semi-structured interviews with residents, averaging two hours per interview, Interviews focus on resident experiences since the start of the pandemic, including a scope of intersectional social, political, environmental, and economic crises and disasters overlapping since March of 2020. A lot happens since March 2020. Within interviews, I invite residents to share their experiences as related to any creative expression they practice, such as art, music, painting, poetry, um, many more. This helps to fulfill my first objective for the critical and affective terms and tourism scholarship and has yielded powerful resident accounts, sharing deep interpretive and emotional experiences related to the many changes embodied since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, I've collected secondary sources um, of information from newspapers and social media to explore the virtual representation and social dynamics impacting Netherlands. So I would like to share some um, brief insight into my preliminary thematic analysis from uh, data Go. So first to start, I've seen a number of method methodological themes from data demonstrating the importance and power of embodied approaches to research within critical affective terms, uh, terms in tourism research. Building from these themes, my methodology has elicited strong data exploring the affective dimensions of crises and disasters within tourism economies, specifically relating to resident and destination identity. This connects to themes relating individual and community identity and resilience through creativity and well-being. Many accounts share the role of live music, woodworking, meditative times out in nature as ways to stay sane, how these outlets saved us and helped to reconnect to both self and community. I've seen uh, the identity, meaning, and role of Netherlands within the greater Intermountain area as a critical role for adaptation and a sustainable future for tourism economies of gateway communities. And this includes recognizing the influences and impact of the resident dynamics expressed within virtual online communities, such as social media and how they influence in-person interactions and long-term um, relationships with residents and interactions within the community. And finally, the importance of health and human services to maintain physical and mental well-being and the quality of being able to live locally is very strong in relation to community identity and resilience. 
So finally, if I have time, I have a, a quote that I felt really characterized the importance of studying change within Intermountain Western Gateway communities. And this quote is from Hermes 37, who says, there are so many people in the community that just don't want Netherlands to change at all, not realizing that it has changed dynamically, regardless of that, since they lived up here, you know, things are always in transition, things are always changing. And we have two options. We can come up with a plan of how we want to market and control that change and direct it in the way that is beneficial, beneficial for the community and the town, or we can do nothing and just let whoever has the most money basically come in and change it to their vision. And I thought that spoke to many themes um, and the aims and objectives of my research and my dissertation. So thank you all for listening. I hope I met my uh, time and I invite any questions or feedback you may have. And I'd like to specifically thank our event coordinators for meeting this session, to my home within the HDNR department at CSU um, and its guiding mentors and faculty and special thanks to my advisor, Dr. Christina T. Cavalier for her tireless efforts and guidance in my PhD experience. I'm looking forward to listening and learning from Katarina's upcoming presentation. Thank you. Julia, thank you so much. Uh, listen, just you have so many um, fascinating things that you're involved in here. And uh, I know a little bit about your your passions and research and, and personal interests and things. I just, can you take a minute and share with us kind of the same thing that I asked of Megan and Bobby in the coming year or two, uh, the near future? What are What is one thing that you're just really excited about before we move on to our, our third present? presentation here. Well, especially after listening to Megan and Bobby, I'm really excited to get deeper into my analysis. You know, really, I just finished my field work this past summer. And so I'm in the beginning stages of my transcriptions. I've got coding down. I have my preliminary thematic analysis. Also, um, with a thematic analysis of uh, similar sources that they used. And I just was excited to see their research. And I'm excited to see where mine goes and how it develops and see it further and progress. I'm also excited to see it progress alongside my work within the lab as they do um, build from each other and help to further everything in very unique ways. So I count myself very lucky for the future. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's interesting. You, you, know, you talked about things have been interesting since March of 2020. I love what you're doing in uh, particular with this comparison of like virtual versus in-person realities local grounding of, you know, what does it mean to, to be grounded, let's say, rooted in that local space. But uh, really great presentation. Julia, thank you so much for, for being with us. Thank you. There's a great XR paper I think you might be on. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, I think everyone will have access to the uh, PowerPoints here later. So we'll uh, definitely be able to share that, that link with everyone. All right. Thank you, Julia. Great to see you. Um, let's move on then with our, our third uh, presenter here. We have Jean Yu Shi from Huazhong uh, Shifan uh, Central China Normal University, um, a university um, that I am very closely connected with. And uh, welcome, Jean Yu. I'd like to read your bio and then give you the mic, give you the speaking. So, Jean Yu Shi is a graduate student in the collaborative Master of Tourism Management program between Central China Normal University and Colorado State University. Uh, based in the beautiful city of Wuhan, China, along the Yangtze River, Jin Yu's research focuses on field-based outdoor education for young people. Uh, this field of research encour encourages students to explore and learn independently through field trip experiences, uh, Jin Yu is currently participating in a research group uh, improving elementary and middle school students' learning ability through outdoor field trips with the hopes that tourism and education can be better combined to make future development more sustainable. So, uh, Jin Yu, it's great to see you. Uh, really a warm welcome. So the Huan Ying Guan Ling, as they say <laughs> in the restaurants in China, to welcome uh, patrons. But anyways, Jeannie, great to see you. Um, take it away. It's all yours. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. So is the screen good? Yes, um, we can. Yes, we can. We can. 
Okay, okay, I'm going to start. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for being on time to come today. Let me introduce myself first. My name is Jin Yu Shi. I'm from Central China Normal University, College of Urban and Environmental Sciences. And my advisor is Professor and Dr. Xie. Um, it's my great pleasure to join the Tourism Naturally Conference and the opportunity to give all of you an introduction of CCNU. So over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to introduce our school from the following five aspects. First is uh, the basics. About CCNU, it's located in Wuhan, Hubei province, uh, and it's included in double world class projects. The university attaches great importance to international exchange and cooperation, and it has in established close academic ties with more than 150, 100, 150 universities and research institutions in more than 70 countries and regions. About our colleague and its uh, representative office of Geographical Society of China in Central China, and is affiliated in night of Hubei province and Wuhan Geographical Society. And it is designated Unite, Unite of Tourism Education and Training in Wuhan. Uh, this is our discipline development history. As you can see, we enrolled the first undergraduate students of tourism management in 1996. 96. So our colleague has a very long story of nearly 30 years. This next is enrollment. These are the enrollment majors and the main courses of each majors in our colleague, which include five undergraduate majors, five academic master majors, three professional master majors, and two international cooperate master majors which are collaborate master programs between Central China Normal University and the Colorado State University. Besides, there are also a geography postdoctoral research mobile station. And there are some uh, main courses like economic geography, uh, physical geography, human geography, and et cetera. Uh, the next is faculty in CCNU. So in our discipline, there are four professors. They are Dr. Hu, Dr. Li, Dr. Xie, and Dr. Xu. And Dr. Hu is our academic leader of tourism management discipline. And there are eight associate professors. They are Dr. Feng, Dr. Cheng, Dr. Gong, Dr. Wang, Dr. Chiao, Dr. Zhang, Dr. Li, and Dr. David Kinnett. Um, each teacher is in her, his or her own field of study and research, and students can choose their own advisor uh, uh, based on their own interests. The next aspect is characteristic construction. So we adopt different training strategies for students at different stages. For example, for undergraduates, we will organize field practice uh, to encourage students to imply theoretical knowledge into practice. We will organize outdoor field trip education. At the same time, students will encourage be in participated in various competitions such as internet innovation and entrepreneurship competitions. Uh, we also have theory oral defense. Uh, while testing professional knowledge, the defense will also exercise students' quick response ability and practical ability to solve problems independently. For post graduates and doctors will pay more attention to training their research ability. We will organize field research, collect and study data, uh, current data. We, in, uh, we encourage them to investigate and do survey. At present, our colleague mainly has 
uh, four research areas and international cooperation research area. The following are the participating professors and associate professors, and there are some uh, selected research results. Uh, they are rural tourism, urban tourism, uh, cultural tourism, and tourist behavior and marketing. And as US China Lab and for destination development, we also have some achievement of international cooperation. And there are some selected publication. Uh, for the international corporate students, in order to cultivate high-level management talents in tourist-related fields with an international vision, the colleague has set up activities such as poster, mark, poster making, research, and international exchange conferences and meetings. For academic communication, we invite many researchers from international schools to give us lectures, such as in this year, we invite Professor Mark Roseberg from uh, Queen University to give us a lecture about healthy geography. And of course, we also go out to attend conferences and lectures abroad. Uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic, our team participated in the 2016 Nature Tourism International Conference, and Professor Xie gave an academic report at a 2016 annual meeting of the America Ge Geography Society. And for students like Han Chao, who gave a presentation at the 2018 at Australia International Conference on Nature Tourism. We also hold internal academic conferences to constantly update our knowledge structure and broaden our knowledge horizon. Uh, for teachers, like in this year, they held a teaching achievement appraisal meeting in January, and teachers and students hold group meetings to study and discuss the progress of paper research every week. And there are some pictures of them. Uh, the next part is campus life. The most popular sports in our school is badminton. Our school has built a new badminton court this year. Besides our table tennis, football, uh, basketball, public square dancing, camping, uh, also very popular. And this year marks the 190th anniversary of the founding of our school. So, and there is a fountain show every night on this square. The school also has an outdoor cinema where students can hold activities. And at last, I want to show you guys a video we have recorded in our discipline by the students. Hope you enjoy it. Hello, everyone. My name is Wang Yanshu. I'm a student of MTM China Project, which is a collaborative Master of Tourism Management program between Central China, Normal University, and Colorado State University. In the past year, I have gained a lot both in study and life. First, in terms of learning, I regard learning as a true thinking journey to explore the meaning of life and curve the idea self. Literature review, research method, field research, writing, and other scientific research daily source of my postgraduate life, which have improved my self thinking ability and knowledge transformation and application ability. Secondly, in my spare time, I play by mention and participate in many competitions. These competitions bring me not only the joy of winning awards, but also a strong body and the spirit to forge ahead. At last, I would like to say that the graduate life is a new beginning. So we should control of life. We should jump out of comfort zone to exercise, to practice, which would make us have more growth. 
Hello, everyone. I am a junior student in Central China Normal University. I think that CCNU has a strong learning atmosphere in the school. During these three years, I feel a great sense of belonging to the school. The ecological environment in the school makes me feel very comfortable, warm in winter and cool in summer. I like every teacher I meet very much. They are funny and humorous. They can teach boring knowledge very interesting. Let me receive a lot of books. I am very happy to come to this. This is my third year in Central China Normal University, and I'm still touched by some wonderful things. In my hometown, the leaves have already turned yellow and fallen off. But the campus of here is still green and fragrant. All the teachers tried their best to teach us what they knew. The class was full and interesting, and my classmates and I work hard at school to prepare for going into the society of further study. Living and studying in CCNU is really a satisfying thing. Hello, I'm Chen Xuan from MTM Project. In the past year, I have gained a lot from MTM. First of all, we mainly adopt bilingual teaching method in the class. All courses are taught by Chinese and American teachers, which has greatly improved my professional knowledge and English communication ability. In addition, we often hold various activities including alumni email exchange, relevant simulation meetings, poster display, and other activities, which increase the interest of learning. At last, in our extracurricular life, we often carry out field research activities and participate in a series of lectures, such as the annual meeting of the Tourism Journal which enables me to gain knowledge from outside the book and further understand the importance of combining theory with the practice. Okay, that's all on my presentations. Uh, thanks for listening. Ah, oh, thank you so much, Jin Yu. Sure, I think I've got the tones right. Uh, just seeing the images of the CCNU campus, hearing your stories, the background, seeing the faculty. Um, I think one of the students there said that the faculty are very funny. Um, I definitely know that. I have spent uh, a year and a half um, at your university there working closely with the faculty and the students. Um, it's been a complete joy. I can't wait to get back. Um, I definitely just want to want to send all the best to you and the whole team and all of the students over there, Jinyu. Um, uh, what was I going to say? I have so much I could say. I do want to point out that our collaborations between, um, you know, your school and CSU were recognized even during COVID and um, the current situation, just uh, um, basically the United Nations World Tourism Organization recognized our program as, as one that is thriving um, amid international uncertainty. And so I just want to thank you and everyone there for, for uh, the, the ongoing collaboration. So um, for the sake of time, we're going to go on, uh, GU, and uh, don't have time to really uh, take any questions right now, but thank you for, for sharing. It's great to see you. Great to see you too, David. All right. Please give my best to everyone over there. All right, everyone, we're going to run a little bit late past the, uh, the mark here, but that's okay. I want to now give our full um, eight-minute presentation time to uh, Marta and uh, Caterini. Um, Caterina, sorry, apologize, um, from the University of Pisa. So um, quick biographies here. So Marta Antonini, uh, is enrolled in the master's degree uh, planning and management of Mediterranean tourism systems at the Luca Campus Foundation. She believes that nowadays, given globalization, it is very important to focus on the possibilities that the tourism sector offers, always respecting the environment. 
Yes. And then uh, we have Katerina Tomei as well, who began with a degree in literary studies, but recently has understood how she's in love with her area, with its culture, tradition, and sense of belonging. She also began studying tourism because she realized how much she loved to interact with tourists and customers. So she enrolled in a tourism master's degree. Nowadays, Katarina feels that we have to focus on what is happening around us. In the touristic field, we have to realize how sustainability is important, as well as nature and local heritage. If we consider that we are living in a globalized era or period, we have to underscore or underline what the environment can offer and what we can do in order to protect it and give a heritage for future generations. So Katerina, Katerina and uh, Marta, it's really great to see you both. I just want to give you a warm welcome. Um, we'll go a little bit over uh, the marker, that's okay, but try to keep your presentation to that eight minute um, time frame, and we'll see if uh, we can wrap this up just a few minutes past our, our session time. But really, really warm welcome to you both. It's all yours. Okay. okay, thank you so much, David. We would like to thank our professor uh, Federico Nicolini, uh, who gives us the opportunity to be here. And when Marta is ready, I'll try to explain. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, I can see you. Yep, okay. we're good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, let's start. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the 7.6% of Italy is occupied by Tuscany, where the population is around 4 million of people. And Florence, Pisa, Lucca, and Siena are the main towns known all over the world for their history, culture, and artistic heritage. By the way, um, Tuscany comprehends, uh, in Tuscany, especially in Lucca, there is our um, uh, department of the university we study tourism and in our uh, formation is included also um, uh, courses uh, focused on the sustainability in tourism such as our second level degree in master degree in planning and governance of tourism system uh, however in tuscany there are 245 protected areas which are a high percentage for the country considering that in Italian peninsula, they are uh, 871. Moreover, you can find also three national parks in Tuscany, which, has, uh, which are the, the Tuscan Appennino, the Tuscan Archipelago, and the Casentino Forests. Uh, can, you, can you move, please? Uh, this, this picture shows Pianosa, one of the seven islands in the Tuscan Archipelago. And this island is particularly, uh, is the only one with, the, with a flat aspect, uh, without any upland. And uh, that is the reason of uh, its name, which is in, it, in, in English means uh, flat. In Pianosa, just like in the other uh, island in the archipelago, some activities are uh, like fishing, diving, mooring, and so on. Uh, are prohibited unless you had a specific uh, authorization. In addition, Tuscany has also three regional parks, uh, which are Aquan Alps, uh, Migliarino San Rossore and Massa Ciccoli Park, uh, and the Maremma Park. The Alps uh, are a mountain chain in the Tuscany's northwest part, uh, and uh, the majority uh, this area is on uh, Lucca and Massa Carrara. In the Epon Alps, the biodiversity is around the 50%, and between flora and fauna, there are also some uh, raised species as well. Moreover, from a hiking point, uh, an hiking and a, an alpine point of view, the Epons are a very prestigious area full of path and rock climbing points. Uh, then uh, there is also the marine area, uh, which uh, where you can find the Tyrrhenia Sea, which borders with the Tuscany West part. And here there are protected uh, marine areas like the Secche della Miloria and the Santuario Pelagos. The latter is uh, a marine zone created by an act between uh, Italy, Monaco and France in order to protect, to protect marine mammals, uh, while uh, uh, the Secche della Miloria arise from rocks whose surface is around uh, 40 kilometers and maybe more, 
extended in a triangular area in the marine section between uh, the coast from Livorno and the Gorgona Island. There are also some reserves, either national, either regional, added to 58 protected landscape with a huge number of sites belonging to Rete Natura 2000. Rete Natura 2000 is an ecological net founded in 1992 by the European Union with a protective name of habitat, rare animals and plants. Uh, in the end, the total amount uh, uh, comprehended 2,637 sites belonging to Rete Natura 2000 and uh, 158 of them are in Tuscany. Okay, you can start, Marta. Yeah, thank you, Caterina. Um, all these areas have a known ecosystem and contain uh, one or more geomorphological formation, crucial at regional and national level for naturalistic, scientific, aesthetic, uh, cultural and educational point of view. For this reason, it's important the participation of authorities in order to guarantee an excellent conservation of uh, these places for, an actual, uh, and for actual and present generations. Okay, through this data, uh, we can notice how Tuscan uh, how Tuscany is important uh, at national and international level. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, for the high number of the attractive elements, Tuscany captures around 10% uh, of Italian tourism and uh, the worth is for the 316 protected areas. Um, the, Tuscany, the Tuscany's famous in touristic field is due to the high quality agricultural products. In fact, 31 products obtained an important European prize, which dis distinguished them for other products than, um, thanks to DOP and EGP. Uh, both of them allow a certain knowledge to the customer about origin and characteristics of the food. And this is one of the biggest themes for a huge number of tourists uh, passionate about the gastronomic areas and who wants to know and recognize uh, uh, quality products. Tuscany um, is aware about the sustainable tourism, particularly for the cycle tourism. In fact, for this reason, the regional government realized the net uh, um, of regional paths for bikes, reserving the 8% to the cycle moving. From 2014 until today has been earmarked more than 64 million, which activate an investment beyond 19 million in order to give progress to the cycle, to cycle areas all over the regional territory. At the same time, there were loans for ordinary and extraordinary maintenance in order to preserve what they did. Uh, going on, um, we put an example of uh, cycle uh, tourism and uh, Eroica, sorry, okay. Um, okay. Eroica is an example of cycle tourism. Um, the, paths, uh, the paths is held around Siena, perfectly signal, signaled and accessible all over the year. There are two paths, the long one that is uh, 205 kilometers and the medium one that is uh, uh, 135 kilometers long. Every year, the Eroica is organized here and the box the old fashioned cycling, uh, grasping uh, enthusiastic people all over the world. The Eroica is the one you can see from the map. Uh, moreover, Tuscany presents more than uh, 50 hiking paths, and the most famous one is La Via Francigena. Uh, this path during the period, uh, during the medieval period, linked to the um, actual French and Germany to Rome, and still today is the favorite way to reach Rome. La Via Francigena passes through Tuscany for uh, 318 kilometers alongside 37 districts, and at the same time, uh, attracts million of, uh, million of tourists from all over the world. The beauty of Tus Tuscany is the fact that you can pass from a highness of 2,000 uh, meters to the seaside, as you can see from the picture, in uh, around uh, one hour. And for this reason, visitors choose Tuscany as holiday's destination because in the same day, they can hike, uh, for example, they can hike on uh, mountains following and then uh, um, have a take a dive in the Martirreno. To conclude, uh, we would like to thank you for you for your attention with this quote. 
And uh, if you have any questions, we are glad to listen and to answer with you. Marta and Katarina, absolutely incredible. I can I can definitely see why um, you know 10% of the tourists in Italy are coming to Tuscany. I have many friends who are uh, cycling enthusiasts from around the world who are ready to make a trip right now. And I will join everyone and come and see you. Um, I wish we had more time and I want to encourage, first of all, I want to thank you both for that amazing presentation and for, for joining us here. Um, I think uh, we'll, we'll consider uh, ways to continue our collaborations at our universities moving forward. I know that a lot of students um, and faculty and practitioners are, are listening to and involved in this conference. And so I would direct everyone um, listening here to reach out to Katerina and Marta um, to extend any additional questions uh, for them. And then I also want to just, uh, again, wrap up this session by saying a thank you to all of the student presenters um, and uh, definitely reach out to anyone um, in this, this session via the Whova app uh, to, to continue the conversation. So Marta, Katerina, thank you very much. Um, and I'll pass it on over here to Emily LeBlanc to continue with our next session. So yes, great to meet you both, Katerina, Marta, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.